Welcome back to a very, very interesting session called A People's History of Language. We have two experts on language uh, in different ways. Let me first introduce you to Peggy Mohan. Please come up on stage. Peggy Mahon is an acclaimed author and academic who has taught linguistics in some of India's reputed institutions such as JNU, Jamia Millia. Uh, she's authored three novels, Jahajin, uh, The Youngest Suspect, and Wanderers, Kings, Merchants, The Story of India Through Languages. It's a, it's a book that I have uh, read. Uh, let me also introduce you to the co-panelist, which is Prachi Deshpande. Please come up. Yeah. Prachi Deshpande is uh, currently working at CSSS in Kolkata. She's a uh, winner of the Infosys Prize, which is a very prestigious prize now in India, uh, and uh, author of uh, some very interesting books. One is in particular, which made waves, called Creative Pasts. In fact, I posted a, a picture of that book on Instagram, and I got a lot of comments saying, this is a book we love. And uh, so clearly, it's a, it's a book which you know, uh, has, has huge resonance across. Uh, and the moderator of this session is Professor Rahul Sarvate, from uh, in-house from Ahmedabad University. And I'm going to hand, it, hand the session over to him. I think, am I audible? Right. Um, so let me start with saying that I'm very nervous. <laughs> I um, am up for, I mean, of course, uh, if I'll find this way, you know, it's my privilege and pleasure to talk to uh, eminent scholars like Peggy and Prachi. Uh, and uh, the theme that we are going to talk about is, I believe, very, very interesting, and it resonates with, uh, you know, with numerous concerns uh, and questions. Um, so let me let me start by um, by asking first of all to Peggy about uh, the specific image that she worked with in her uh, beautiful book, Wanderers, Kings, and Merchants, of Tiramisu Bear, the Tiramisu Bear. Right. Okay, that's a, a tiramisu bear. That is a term that my, I asked my daughter because she's very good at giving me captions for things. And the idea of a hybrid version of a polar bear and a grizzly bear, which is created when a grizzly bear, because of climate change, migrates north. And when he migrates in the wrong season, he's there with the polar bear mating season. And the female polar bear is not on an ice floe because they don't exist as much anymore. It's on land. So he m mates with this female polar bear, and the result is a light brown bear. But the point is, knowing this bear, you know its entire history that it could only be the father that went north as a grizzly because only males migrate. And that's a metaphor for language as well. And that the female is in her natural habitat. He finds her there. And I use that as a metaphor of language mixing because it's not a random mixing that a bunch of words get thrown into a cauldron and you uh, have a, a number of, shall we say, Indus Valley words and Sanskrit words mixing. It doesn't happen like that. There's a pattern, and similarly, there's the male migration, which comes in, which generally, but not totally, donates vocabulary. It's a sperm donation. It does gives its sperm, it goes away. The real structure, the incubation, is done on the maternal line by the local women who marry these men. And therefore, the languages capture this by having a substratum or an internal structure, the thing that doesn't die when they bury, the thing that remains when for millennia after they bury you, is your bone structure. And that tends to be local and older than the words. So it's kind of useful for me because if I'm working on the bones and I'm working on what is older, it's good for me that the flesh goes away because the words are the things that confuse us the most in India from village to village, oh, you know, this dialect changes and so the bones don't change so much. So it's a very good thing to be able to track. So once you have this model and you see a language, you can hypothesize that this is what happened. Migrants were male. And actually, in truth, almost every actual migrant into India was male. 
the first Indians were not migrants, they were merely spreading out. But that, that is why on, in almost every Indian, uh, there is a strong trace on the female line of original first Indians. Because these were the people who met all the migrants and that if there's mixture, it tends to come on the male line. And even in my case, it's a metaphor of me, a young Indian boy going to Canada to study at a time when Indian girls did not migrate. He met my mother. So you know straight away that uh, males going, local females, and then therefore the children, you know their history before you even have to ask because there's a pattern. Excellent. I mean, uh, in, all, in some sense, Arun, can we say that we're all tiramisu bears of some kind? <laughs> you know, this is something that I have increasingly begun to ask myself because even, well, more in the context of language because I'm not as interested in human genetics. I'm not a geneticist, but <clears throat> we have been calling these languages creoles, which is a term that is used a lot in the Caribbean, which is where I was born. And uh, my first exposure in linguistics was in a department where we were talking massively about Creole um, languages from, with an African substratum and European sperm donation. And Africans, of course, were not women, but it is very interesting that what I'm now finding, looking at people in the last few years, just working on this, African, the Creoles only came up when women started coming as slaves. When women were not coming as slaves, we were not getting them. So, but if this is the model, uh, and almost every language, say French, Spanish, uh, all the languages of North India going into Marathi, maybe Nagamese is a, is a complicated thing because it is new and didn't have to go through this crucible of fire. But if so many languages have this in their past, uh, do we want to call it Creole, which suggests Caribbean sea breezes? Are we all mixtures of men who migrated and met local women? And it looks increasingly so. So I'm wondering if I should start dispensing with the word Creole anyway, or tiramisu bear. We all are. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a context, I think, because I'm trying to explain this to myself as well. Not coming from linguist, linguistics and, you know, as a, as a, as a, uh, there's no training uh, for me in linguistics. So I'm, I'm trying to make sense of this question of uh, the interrelationship between languages, particularly things that we uh, grew up listening about, that uh, Hindi is derived from Sanskrit or... Uh, um, um, so in some sense, if I'm not incorrect, Am I, uh, are you suggesting that, the, um, that, that in some sense the substratum uh, is more significant and that substratum comes from the maternal language line and then there is a, a, a synthesis of a kind in the production of languages? Well, I don't know how to say more significant. It's very important and very durable. Um, the, the male line tells you a lot about current day politics, recent history, the economic situation. We are speaking English without any of us actually being British. And obviously it has to do with a need and a niche in India where, which this filled in some way. It just replaced Persian, it replaced Sanskrit. Elites wanted a language. But there's something else that I have always thought about Indian languages. More in the north, I, the south is a little more sorted out, but there too. When we study Hindi or Marathi in school, our teachers teach us something which to me is unrecognizable. They only look at what has been told to them that these are Tatpurush, this is Dvigu, this is all from Sanskrit, and that's not about our languages. No Indian child is taught that we have a difference between Hua and Hogia, which is unique to the subcontinent. We have sounds which are unique, Dur, Dur, Na, Erla, and sha, which are unique to the subcontinent, except Australian Aborigines, the same first migration out of Africa. We are not told that in Marathi, Hindi, I think Gujarati, and l less overtly the further you get from Delhi, um, the past tense of verb agrees with the object. Many khana khaya, but khana khaya. 
Uh, and I think in Marathi, you wouldn't put the ne with the me anymore because you're too far from the transmitting tower of Delhi, which is where the Kuru dynasty was at the time that this happened. And we can date these things that are in Indian languages. And they are not the things that are taught. We are not even conscious of them. We speak correctly all the time. But in a way, it takes someone who, I, my family would be from just where this stops, in the um, past Allahabad, in the Magadhan area, where we have a problem with gender. I mean, why is a chair feminine? Why? And I discovered later that even if I asked you to give me the gender of a Hadron Collider, you would all agree what it was, even if you had never thought of it before. So that in a way that there, is, there are these old things in India that um, we haven't explored as being the exciting things in India. When Russians meet us, they say, haven't you thought about perfectives and imperfectives? And so I said, hua and ho gya. You would say, nahi hua, but you never say, nahi ho gya. So what is going on? And we say, no, we just let people make mistakes. We haven't thought about it. And there's not enough work done on these old things. And what I'm doing right now, quite after my book, is trying to subtract out and time when these things came into our languages and see if what can, we can get a picture of the bone structure of what was there before. And of course, in this part of India, it's going to be the Indus Valley languages because uh, what were they like? Why did we get all these funny past tenses? Uh, how old is this hua and hogia? Why are our verbs full of gender, whereas verbs should not have gender at all? Are our verbs verbs at all? What kind of people were we who didn't like verbs and like nouns? All of this is not addressed. And uh, it's only, I think, when you run up against it as a problem, because you can't understand why a verb has a gender, that you think about it. And in fact, problems are a very good thing, because it, it alerts you to things that others have been so good at that they have never noticed that there's a lot of history in it. Fascinating, absolutely. Now that uh, you mentioned this question of Marathi, let me turn to Prachi about uh, uh, this. Um, you know, I found this very fascinating phrase in, uh, in your recent work on um, uh, cursive histories, where you mention, where you refer to Kolatkar's poem and his idea of hiding in history. So he wants to hide in history behind philology and grammar. Would you like to explain this to us? Hello. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, before jumping into into Kolatkar, you know, one of our finest poets in in Marathi, let me say that uh, sort of my approach to to language is uh, uh, some very different from from Peggy, who sort of ranges across millennia or across you know centuries and 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 thousands of years and so many languages, and I sort of intensively go into, into one or two languages for a very short period of time. So this kind of macro, micro thing is something that Rahul is going to have to kind of manage. Uh, uh, and, and there might be a bit, you know, uh, sort of going back and, and forth between that. But um, uh, what I've, I've, I quote Kolatkar at the beginning of one of the chapters uh, in my recent book, uh, Scripts of, of Power, uh, where he's talking about this allure of language, you know. Um, why do we need to know what our languages are and were, you know. And, and this urge to sort of find out where our languages come from, it's not enough, uh, like Peggy was, was, was saying, that uh, to sort of work with the flesh that we have, I'm just working with the same metaphor now, um, to work with the flesh that we have right now, but to try and understand where it came from, what the bone structure uh, might be, 
and uh, this is how we've we've done histories of language right uh, if you if you've ever read the history of a language it will probably be the history of gujarati literature from the 12th century to uh, now or the history of english literature from the earliest times to to uh, whenever you know the elizabethan age and so on so literature is one way through which uh, you know people have tried to locate languages in history and uh, the other is linguistics which is to try and find a kind of structural uh, a framework through which you can understand uh, how languages evolved um, and this begins sort of in the 18th century when uh, the orientalist researchers sort of find out that there are so many similar sounding words uh, you know in different languages spread across different uh, places and then there is the saying oh you know then this can perhaps tell us about how people moved uh, uh, as well and um, so there is this kind of urge to turn towards history to understand then what it is we are speaking right now amongst ourselves uh, right and um, this of course you know creates it this kind of you know is almost a kind of thrill of then reaching out to human speech in the past if you think you have understood how a word changed over time then maybe you also can understand how the speaker changed over time as well and so you get histories of communities and not just sort of individual speakers but whole groups of 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 people and kolatkar you know being the sort of uh, very powerful critic that he was of all of our very easily held assumptions you know whether about uh, you know somebody whether a folk deity like khandoba or whether you know sort of like a, a cosmopolitan city like bombay and he had this very powerful imagery uh, with which he would just kind of of um, break down certain very easily held assumptions he would force you to look at something that you had always thought was was uh, was general ha huh? of course that's the way things are and so this this kind of fragment in in uh, one of his kind of unpublished poets was that you know history is like ruins uh, you know what you have are really very fragmentary archives available to us and we search for for history in these ruins we think we can imagine the entire building uh, by looking at these ruins and sometimes history becomes a kind of refuge for us you know we think that by telling small fragmentary stories we have the whole picture we like to actually hide in those ruins for a little while and think maybe this is what the house was like and and so that's both the lure of of history not just of language but but history as a whole but it is also the power of of history it is why we write history we read and and research history and that's why we are all here today as well right i mean uh, and so so yeah thank you for beginning with kolatkar because you know he in a sense i mean this is history literature after all he manages to say in very few words what you know scholars like us take 500 pages and sometimes can't say as eloquently either so yeah if i'm not incorrect i think he refers to historians as pangolins eating ants uh, yes yeah yeah <laughs> so he, he yeah he describes the in the same poem that that uh, and the same poem is written in marathi as well right he imagines it as a varul uh, as a as a kind of ant uh, hill which as you know you know can be a problem if you if you if you disturb it uh, uh, but it's also something that has accrued over over time it's something that that has layers of 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 work and meaning in it uh, fascinating um this uh, you know it would um, uh, also be probably a good time to reflect on the larger project that you worked for uh, in particularly in your recent work um i think at one level what you're suggesting is that modi as a script is seen in the modi script of course was used uh, to document uh, bureaucratic affairs uh, rather than any sacred uh, texts and when the colonial archive is looking at modi in suspicion assuming that it is the suspicious brahmin network that is at work here is also being seen as suspicious from the vantage point of non brahminism as a political ideology it is also seen from the emergent nationalist elite as too much uh, influenced by perso arabic uh, you know um, idioms Uh, in some sense modi represented uh, uh, all these things at the same time so how does one view this 
in terms of uh, as a site which simultaneously manifest multiple meanings and and, and as, as you said i think very appropriately is that not only that you interested in those who are writing cursive scripts but your method is also a kind of writing cursive history as if you're writing history without lifting your pen so how are you managing that uh, okay uh, again you know um this is this is an, a question quite like an anthill itself with so many layers that that i'm 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 going to try but um uh, you know uh, peggy's work emphasizes the importance of retroflex uh, in studying indian languages and never was a retroflex so important as now when i'm going to talk about the modi script uh, uh, you know uh, and so when i talk about the script of power i'm i'm not talking about a kind of political script of of power being being scripted uh, you know right before our eyes but we're talking about a, a um, the modi script which literally means bent or or broken like the persian shikasta which was also a broken um, this is a kind of um, uh, cursive script which you could write with joint letters uh, from about the, the the 16th century really is when we start seeing it in large uh, numbers uh, to write business administrative revenue documents in uh, uh, western uh, india and later on in the in the peninsula as well so this was written alongside uh, balbodh or devanagari script which was used to write uh, sacred and and uh, literary texts in in marathi and what i did in my my recent uh, book was to kind of follow the modi script wherever it would take me uh, you know so um, uh, thinking about who used it um, why was it used in specific places how did people um, you know sort of depending on where it was used and why and how how could we actually make a sense of how people thought about language you know so if you are talking about the people's history of 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 language over here not to necessarily think of of language and scripts as something out there you know which happens by itself and which is governed entirely by by rules um Uh, although those are important but to actually see how ordinary speakers and writers and readers and so on make sense of these concepts and how these change over time especially over large sort of of periods of of transition and so i looked at the modi uh, uh, script and uh, what what i found is a very interesting history of how people uh, related to writing and to language in many different uh, ways so we find that the modi script actually uh, emerges also the legend after it is that um, um it was given as a gift by the uh, lankan king vibhishana uh, to hemadri or hemad pant as he is known uh, the minister of the last yadava uh, ruler at devagiri um, and uh, in exchange for an ailment that he had helped uh, uh, him you know sort of cure him of and so modi became uh, uh, the kind of of the script of all scribes uh, as it were and it's used by by a large brahmin class of of scribes but they use it specifically only for non literary and non sacred texts so it becomes a way for them to both participate in what are seen as profane or laukic or non religious domains uh, while keeping their ritual hierarchy intact so they may work for a non brahmin chief they may work for a muslim sultan or a muslim sultan's uh, establishment however this does not affect their traditional sort of position in the hierarchy so the script has not just a kind of functional meaning as such it gets a cultural uh meaning attached uh, to it right uh, and this changes what your what the question that you asked is that this meaning changes over over time because it's cursive it's not easy to read over time a small scribal class gets kind of control over it when um and of course as we know you know literacy is not that widespread in uh, the the 17th and 18th century so a very small class is literate anyway um but when the british come in the early 19th uh, century they are interested in looking at a lot of these maratha records to find out um what the you know sort of uh, revenue system is how they might actually tax the people rayatwari and all of this is 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 starting and they ask the local scribes to to help them with this material and 
they find both the script very tedious and the scribe very untrustworthy. Right? So um, many of these scribes later on, you know, the, the Brahmin class that is the, uh, most of, of, of the scribes also becomes involved in the uh, nationalist movement by the late 19th century. So we see how ideas of script, scribe, uh, and uh, caste, etc., get fused in many different ways, right? So the script itself becomes a kind of, of uh, illegible barrier that the colonial state cannot cross. Um, and so there are efforts to say that, oh, this is inherently illegible. We must get rid of it. Uh, what is more legible? The Devanagari script is more, becomes more legible. Now, you could say that no script is inherently legible or illegible. You know, it's a question of teaching and being able to, to read. But that's the thing that I'm also looking at, that when people relate to ideas and concepts, they don't remain objective, singular, and eternal in meaning. Meanings attached to terms, to practices, and, and so on. And those then help us understand how people relate to language. Another way in which Modi and Balbodh and so on kind of become involved in the way people use language is that Modi doesn't differentiate between Rasva and Dirgha vowels. Okay. But Devanagari does. Um, and um, in the 19th century, when literacy is expanding, new textbooks are being written and so on, there is an effort to try and make written and, and uh, oral language as close to each other as possible. So then people say, what is this? If this script cannot differentiate between Rasva and Dirga, then it cannot be suitable for print. You know, it cannot be suitable for teaching young children what correct spellings are and so on. And so then it kind of also uh, uh, fades, fades out. So there are political, pedagogical, social sort of meanings that, that attach in different ways to the kind of rise and fall of the Modi script. And through that, this is what I've tried to kind of say, is how we can understand people's sort of, different groups of people's attachments and usages of, of language writing and, and writing practices. Amazing. It's also noteworthy to uh, recognize the name that is um, given to Modi script. It was called Pishachalipika. Uh, Pishach, it's referring to the demons. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps it might also be a good cause to locate these demons in the Prakrits <laughs> from it, linguistics. In fact, I often, we have a similar thing in the north. And uh, I know my family left India 150 years ago when we were only using uh, Kaiti script. because, and, But in the north, it didn't have a Brahmin touch. It was very much a suddenly craftsmen and traders coming into their own. And it is dated back to the time when modern languages start to appear in, in the north. I don't know, Mar Maharashtra has had language um, in the literary um, record, modern languages since the 10th century anyway. So these are what they came in. And I often like when people say, what does it look like, Mahajani or Kaiti? I said, it looks like a Prakrit form of Devanagari. And in fact, the Devanagari, whenever you see it in use in Marathi and Hindi, you have to know the British were there saying what you had before did not work. And we had to get rid of it. My great grandfather used to write to family in Aligarh in India and use this uh, Kathy script. And once when I as a child told him, I want to learn Devanagari, I want to learn Hindi, because I assumed, you know, they were keeping it from me because it was a secret language of adults. Children didn't know Hindi. And when he finally was convinced that it was safe to teach me, but that maybe I should not go back to India because that was not what he wanted the family to do. Of course, I'd done it. Um, he brought out his Kathy books too. And I, unusual in, in that day and age, would not have happened in India, I found myself learning to write in this script because it was what we, our little community, which was non-Brahmin, non-farmer, it was really the nexus between tradesmen and the kind of craftsmen who were involved with big things to do with the economy. Who, who could mint your coins but us? Because we were the the gold and silversmiths. So we would be using these kinds of scripts. 
And uh, it's an interesting thing that uh, somebody I am now in touch with in Bangalore is working on the Indus Valley seals. And she managed to find a few forms, which I, I, said, I think of the Indus Valley seals as QR codes. They are not words, and they are not phonetic. And, but the point is that she found a, some seals and some unfinished pieces of jewelry and tools in a workshop which was excavated, and certain processes drawn as their logograms. And these are all in tools that we ourselves would use. So to what extent is uh, empire, economy, linked, okay, maybe to tradesmen, maybe to kings, maybe to Brahmins, but to the smiths who minted the coins. So that's where I somehow come into this, and it was really exciting that finally I might have some uh, emotional link back to early, early days in India, that what was writing for? Writing was not to say your name, it was to certify this was the quality of gold that was in this, and you can see like in two Indus Valley seals, the only thing different between the silver looking one and the gold looking one is the symbol that defines gold is missing in the non-gold looking one. So you're, you're, you're seeing something like hallmarking going on. So who are the people, the dhobis did their own kind of hallmarking. All kinds of people who were not involved in epics and uh, of important uh, philosophical things, they had their reason for writing. And in fact, they had a greater reason for writing than Brahmins because there was a memorization pattern for a lot of the, I mean, there are, there are pandits who can tell you the whole Ashtadhyayi. Uh, he could re recite it on the way to the river and on the way back and the whole thing is done. I mean, you don't need to consult it, though I have my feeling that Parnini probably did write things down. With a name like that, couldn't he have been our kind of people making currency, Parnis? I wonder. But anyway, so I'm seeing all kinds of things uh, linked up. And you said that you look very deeply into one part of India. That's the one part of India I would dearly love to know about. And I don't get enough data on it. And you just were born with it. This is the southern Maharashtra and northern Karnataka region where there's still fluidity and borders have not been firmly established. And you can see the back and forth. Do we want gender? Do we have gender? Do we have this nay thing in the past? All of these are very interesting markers on how things penetrate, who is speaking, and uh, questions of does gender bleed across borders better than the past tense? So I like looking at things like that. But So you have it all there, and you haven't gone into it because you're looking at something else. Yeah. So it isn't that I uh, look down on that. I really dearly want the data. Well, it's a, I, I mean, just to, to add to that, if I may, that it's a, you know, really interesting way to think about how differently we can write histories of the same thing. You know, so I mentioned earlier that there are literary histories of language or there are linguistic histories. And, and uh, you can, of course, write social histories of language too. And, you know, the very border that, that uh, uh, you talked about, the Karnataka uh, Maharashtra border, there has been so much social linguistic work and, and sort of uh, social work on, on who exactly speaks Kannada and who speaks Marathi and how to actually kind of, you know, count these people and put them in different medium schools and, and so on. And that also has become a sort of very political question, uh, you know, over time. Um, and uh, these sort of also then decide, uh, you know, sort of very large, uh, pol make political decisions and decide people's futures in, in, in very complex uh, ways. But there are also sort of cultural histories of language that can be done, which is, is sort of where I, I come from, and which is to ask really then, um, you know, how how do people make sense of things like grammar even, right? Uh, or how do people make things of, uh, you know, sense of, of things like you speak that way and I speak that way. What's the relationship between us? Uh, how do you write about that? How does that impinge on the way in which uh, an orthography is decided for uh, 
uh, the language as a, as a whole, what arguments do people make? How is script reform decided? On what basis? Uh, you know, how does the history of a language and its descent, say, whether it's in the Indo-Aryan or Dravidian family and so on, impinge you know, sort of on very everyday decisions that people have to make. Sometimes they're in a decision-making uh, uh, position, sometimes it's, it's decided for them, but um, what you can see through a cultural history of, of language is really very large structures kind of, of operating in the everyday. Uh, right, so uh, so it's very very interesting to think of verbs, nouns, and and people and concepts like multilinguality all at at once together. You use well. the word operating. I dis describe the substratum as an operating system. So any computer person will know unless the operating system is working. Uh, in fact, I had sent a, a photograph, which has probably not been incorporated. I made a mosaic of a dragon, of, well, here, an octopus on my terrace. And I have a photograph of it being put in uh, the stones, pretty multicolored granite. And um, along with it is a white marble, or almost white marble. Oh, you, you actually do have it. No, it's not in the PowerPoint yet. It was not incorporated. I just sent it as a separate slide at the end. Don't worry. Uh, but the idea being, those are the words, all the lovely, pretty, pretty colors. No, the, the, it's not in here. Don't, don't, don't bother with this. Um, so these words need something. Otherwise, they are just movable stones. I wanted a floor. And the floor in tech in masonry terms is a matrix, and matrix comes from the Latin word for mother. So the white cement that holds my granite pieces together, along with some other pieces of marble which look white, that white cement is not something you pay attention to, but it's not an, it's operating system in a sense. It is the thing that's holding together the floor. And the grammar is, not just, you know, so that's why when I see philologists looking at words and trying to think what was the Indus Valley language and they find some stray word in the Rig Veda and say, yeah, this, this must be from Munda, this must be from Elamite, this must be from Dra Dravidian, that's a piece of granite. I want to know about the cement, which nobody's paying attention to, which held it all together. And uh, so... In modern words, modern terms, it's an operating system. Everyone here, not everyone, has had a child and seen that the first thing the kid picks up is words. A few words, they say that, and then they take a back seat. They don't talk for some time, and you get worried, and you start consulting pediatricians and thinking of autism. And It's not that. They have learned how to identify a few objects but the operating system has to be installed before it can be used in a meaningful way. And that operating system is something we don't know much about how it's installed because everybody teaches you how to speak a language. No one teaches you how to understand. So they have to have understanding in place before they can take it forward and insert these pieces into this wet cement and create something that is usable. So in a way, I, I see these, uh, like the cement and the granite, the different layers of the tiramisu bear, and um, what geneticists talk about, the different layers of the Indian uh, pizza. Tony Joseph loves to say that. Uh, it's a very useful way of understanding history, I find. Absolutely. Uh, this is something I think it named as this aerial uh, linguistics or linguistic archaeology or ways in which uh, the method that you deploy is indicating this complexity involved in this interrelationship between languages. I would like to pick on this relationship between language and communities, those who speak language. And you also talked about the merchants, the wanderers, the, the dobies. Uh, you know, in some sense, I'm also uh, uh, wondering about uh, this question in two ways. One is the distinction that is already in place in linguistics between Western Indian languages and Eastern Indian languages. 
And what I really wonder about as someone who not comes from, who's not a linguist, but who is a historian and who has experienced a certain uh, passions for the tongue in the Eastern language belt, as in there are works like Lisa Mitchell's on Telugu, Sumati Ramaswamy's on Tamil, uh, that indicate that uh, there is a certain passion for language about uh, in, in Telugu, about Telugu in, in Andhra, about Tamil Nadu, about Tamil in Tamil Nadu. Of course, we know that there is a statue of Tamil language called Tamil Tai, or a statue of Telugu Tali uh, in, in Andhra. Uh, why don't we have a statue of Gujarati language in Ahmedabad? Why is that passion uh, about language not present in the Western categorization, like from Punjabi, Gujarati, Marwadi, Marathi? Why don't we see that? So is there, a, uh, is there something linguistic reasoning for this? I have a theory nowadays, and I've, my students asked me about this in my last class, something like this. Uh, we keep talking about very big standard languages and continuities among regions, and that's of course again a different thing. We, I assume there's an Indus language family. I'm saying a very lot of loaded things. To have a language family, you're making a statement of empire and of absorption and quite a lot of loss and death of small languages in the process. Now, when we say that there is a wonderful thing called Marathi, which it, there isn't yet completely because many outlying areas are not completely in harmony with how things are done, so, same with, with Hindi. but. The idea that you have a standard language is a very late thing. And as I said, a lot of bloodshed has taken place on small languages over that. Similarly, with a continuum of languages, which is what you get in the entire area from the Indus Valley region down into Maharashtra, which means an unresolved, an incomplete massacre of small languages. So the question is, even before that, when before there was an Indus Valley language, wouldn't it make sense that there were, in fact, there was even more diversity where you could not understand one from the other, like you have now in Nagaland. In Nagaland, they claim that you cannot understand one, lang one Naga language from another or one dialect from another, yet, when you sit down with a grammar, there's one grammar. So there are two things going on. People come into an area, and then they spread out, and you get what's called drift. So you get, drift is a natural thing. As people spread out, their horizons remain about the size of their village or whatever more powerful community they are. And the other thing is that when you have this kind of drift, in comes a larger community and gives the sperm donation of words, which we've had all over the north. Don't think for a minute that the words we're using in Hindi, Bengali, Punjabi, any of these languages are original. They come from the Prakrits. So something was there before as to what it was. Even that probably had something there before which was much more isolated and diverse. You look at a language like Burushaski in Hunza, in uh, the Karakorams, and we say it's an isolate. How many isolates could we have had that we have actually killed and that we're all sitting on the debris of them? And yet, funnily enough, you look at all these languages, including Burushaski and you're finding the skeleton is not as different as you expected. I, so you're getting the possibility of a very early time and a middle time where you can talk of a, sim, a similar substratum of the whole Indus Valley region. And then you have a later time when we say that there's something called Tamil. And the, you use the word Tamil, Tamil, but is it really the same thing as what was spoken way back then? We, we don't make these distinctions. It's quite possible that that too has, I mean, the, how can they say they don't have a lot of flux? There is no one Tamil. And um, Malayalam hasn't even bothered to try. Every Malayali speaks differently. 
so this is a very normal thing. So it's a pretense going on that we have an empire, but actually on the ground, every little district is doing it differently. Absolutely. And of course, uh, that we know that it is a modern way of looking at languages, this passion for language, in, in particularly in South India. Um, I, in fact, would, uh, you know, was wondering if, as, as your book mentions the world of Anand Rao and, and Narayan Rao, and this beautiful multilingual worlds that they traverse, that they speak and navigate between Telugu, Tamil, Kannada, Marathi, um, is that world entirely lost now, or is, is, it, is it a way that we can rethink of the possibility of recreating that world um, at all? <clears throat> and that is, does that have anything to do with uh, this nature of this passion that we experience about language? Okay. Um, well, you know, I think it's, it's useful, um, again, in a slightly shorter kind of, of time span, to, to think of kind of two contradictory forces that act on the way we understand language, right? One is a kind of, of centrifugal uh, force and the other is a centripetal uh, force. There's always a, a, an urge by political uh, and bureaucratic uh, powers, you know, states and empires have been with us for a, for a long time, to try and, and amalgamate uh, as much as, as, as possible, sometimes differentiate at different levels, but nevertheless to try and centralize. And that has an effect on the way we understand language as well, right? So there is a lot of diversity on the ground, but through legal testimonies and things, even though these are, are oral, when they get written down, there is an, a, a kind of standardization that happens over time in the medieval period as well. But definitely in the modern period, modern states don't like diversity. Right? And they want to try and simplify and unify either for the bureaucracy or for uh, education. The impulse is very much that everything must be as uniform as, as possible. And so there, definitely, this, this uh, happens. But nevertheless, you know, as, as you uh, uh, put it, uh, Peggy, also, that, that there is drift. And no matter how much states try to kind of make things uniform and make everything like one language, one official uh, language, whatever, people speak in different ways, right? People's attitudes to their uh, languages at home, at, in the market, and so on, changes. Now, the, the people that you are talking about, Anand Rao and Narayan Rao, and, um, you know, these, these are very two very interesting uh, men. In the early 19th century, uh, they were um, assisting Colin McKenzie. So Colin McKenzie was the surveyor of the East India Company after uh, they, uh, the company defeated um, Tipu Sultan and took over his territories in, in uh, the peninsula and in Mysore. And he was the surveyor trying to kind of, of uh, map everything for the company. But he was very interested in, in languages and in local histories. He only knew English. He was sort of woefully mo monolingual. But he hired a range of, of um, the very kind of scribes that I was talking about earlier who were adept in many languages and scripts. So um, they worked in Arcot, whom uh, uh, Dr. Kulkarni mentioned uh, earlier. And uh, they then took employment in his kacheri, or Mackenzie's kacheri. And they went around the peninsula gathering local histories for him. And uh, he left behind a huge archive, right, which uh, is one of the major archives we have for the history of, of uh, uh, South India in the medieval uh, period. And it's, it just gives you a sense of the sheer profusion of languages and scripts that a small group of, of literate people, but nevertheless had, uh, you know, for certain kinds of, of, of writing and so on. And so lots and lots of histories of local temples and so on. Narayan Rao and Anand Rao knew a lot of, so they went, when they come to Ahmadnagar, they come to Aurangabad, and they speak in Marathi, they write in Modi script, they go to Bellari, um, you know, they go to, to um, Gadwal and so on. They travel in the Andhra territories where they, they speak and write in Telugu. They also write in, in Hale Kannada. They write in, in uh, you know, sort of uh, cursive Kannada. Um, uh, so their notebooks are just like, you know, uh, full of, of, of these. But you have to ask, you know, whether 
the stories that they heard were in the same lang the the same registers that they also wrote them in maybe people spoke in dakni but you know they wrote them down in a familiar kind of register that 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 they knew so you see a lot you get a sense of even more diversity of of usage through the 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 profusion that is there in in that archive as well now we celebrate this multilinguality and and sort of say that are re now everything you know earlier my grandfather used to speak so many languages and i remember when we were growing up we spoke so many languages and so on but now everybody you know knows barely one or or two uh, and so on and so there is this lament about whether that kind of multilinguality can come back or not and i think it's 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 more kind of it's an important question to ask of course that how can we nurture our multilinguality in different spaces but to even engage that question we have to then go back to these histories of practice and see what people like anand rao and narayan rao were, were doing um and he he gets asked by the the king of gadwal i remember when he goes to the court and the, he says do you know persian and at one point he says yes and then at another point we see him writing saying that he doesn't know no no persian so maybe he was also kind of you know uh, uh playing around with his his language skills in 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 interesting ways which we also do right sometimes when we go to a different uh, uh, area we don't let on that we know the local language uh and then we hear a lot of stereotypical comments being made about about different communities and so on and then you quickly slip in a, a sentence uh and then people say oops uh you know so 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 language skills are also used in in different ways i think it's important then to capture now what are the different kind of power dynamics uh, that our language is in uh, even as we kind of ask to kind of uh, nurture them and and preserve them and and so on so language passions mm -hmm. i mean yeah um there are i think there are good passions and there are unnecessary passions of language uh, uh you know uh, the key is to know the the absolutely. the absolutely. limit uh, yeah. as in as you pointed out that they when they were traversing across languages they were using these languages for specific functions like telugu for karnataka music classical music or uh, marathi or persian for maintaining the bureaucratic daftar or tamil for personal communication and writing poetry so i think if there is that uh, you know um, um way in which language played a specific role each language had a role to play as if you have a space uh, uh, within which there are multiple languages cohabitating together and for Yeah, it's I think, that world yeah, that yeah. yeah i think i mean i think that's the key uh, which you might say is the transition moment from an early modern understanding of language you know before sort of the modern state or the 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 uh, print uh, you know world sort of kind of uh, uh, changes the way way uh, language and society interact uh, i think there is a, there is a greater flexibility or comfort with the idea that you use different languages in different contexts and that it's okay to do so you know that it's okay to not know one language in a particular uh, context that i think was a uh, was a concept people were more comfortable with before the modern period but with you know the coming of the mass bureaucracy and the mass sort of of uh, Mm, projects of the modern state the we have somehow become comfortable with that idea that in a region one language must be there for everything and that people also then become identified by it and uh, if you don't know it you must know it and if you must know it in a particular way and and that becomes a kind of of mode of uh, creating that regional uh identity or that regional self uh, as well right and exactly. and that i we see um resistance to that in different ways uh in different regions of of the country either people are shamed because they don't know the standard you know their pronunciation is not up to par um or they are uh you know there are there's debates all the time about what uh the sign board should be there are debates all the time about what the third language should be everybody should learn this should not learn that remove this bring that so that that idea that it should there should be these sweeping 
sort of, of policies in place for, for singular languages is something that, you know, has become, is I think an artifact of, of modernity. Absolutely. I've tried to sort of look at it through how the, the, the bureaucratic and pedagogic processes happen, but they are very much with us. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. You know, in some sense it reminds me that Vinoba Bhave knew 16 languages. 16? And 16. Who did? Vinoba Bhave. Uh, Gandhi himself knew 10 languages, Ambedkar knew about 8 languages, so it's, these were the people not too far away from uh, where we stand today in time. Um, and in that sense, what if, uh, because of all of the, these processes that, is, that you mentioned, uh, enables language to become the site of primordial identity, yes. rather than a more engaged and intertwined literary and intellectual culture yes. uh, with, intertwined with other languages. So in fact, that would bring me to your way of seeing at language, that language are essentially deeply connected to one yes. another. Yes. And the connection that you also point out is very fascinating for me because you're saying in some sense that look at the relationship that Bhojpuri has with Bangla. Or it doesn't uh, recognize it at all. Exactly. Yes, and I, would, I came, as a, came as a shock to me that I could understand when Bengalis were talking because uh, my older Bhojpuri was there. But uh, it's an interest, I want to add something to, to what you're saying, because we look at history, recent history, history far in the past, we're not looking at a progression going into the future. We are in a direction of flow. And I think that whenever we talk of uh, benign, monolingualism in a village, that's long ago. People get more connected, then they speak more languages, then there comes a time when you have many languages for many things, but it doesn't end there. That what do your children do? We have children coming into schools these days who only know English, who come up to you and say, ma'am, tell me what he's saying, because this guy is speaking Hindi with a Bihari accent. We cannot follow him. And I'm saying, what's the matter with you? Obviously you can, and obviously they can't. There's a direction of flow. What will our children take abroad? They'll, take, they'll create a situation where kids will learn English, Indian English, Prakrit, and that's a term I, uh, let, let me get into that. We are speaking Prakrit English right now. I'm using Prakrit as a technical term. It's nothing to do with Ashoka uh, or Adhamagadi or any of these things. We are speaking a Prakrit of English, which is our own, mostly identifiable by accent, but a few little things, like we will say, this is with me only, because we don't like using the verb to have, because it doesn't exist in our languages. So we will take that abroad with us, and our children will know who's a nani, who's an aji, who's a dadi, who's a what, and that is where it will begin and end. Now, that's not unusual. Do you know that the Mughals and the Sultanate, when they came into India from Central Asia, they did not come from Iran? We keep hearing about Persian. They did not come from Iran. They came from Uzbekistan, which had the same relationship between Uzbek and Persian as we have with our languages and English. The opening line of uh, Babur's um, uh, Tuske, Tuske Babri uh, is not in Persian. It's in uh, Chaktai. And uh, in Uzbekistan, he's not regarded as the emperor of India. He's just the first great Uzbek writer. But the point is, when he came to India and brought people we have words like similar to nani and aji and dadi uh, that have remained. You have khala, khalu, you have apa. Not too many. You cannot find many of their words. They came and they dumped whatever was their vernacular and kept their high language. Our people go to Silicon Valley and they keep nani, dadi and dump. And they move on. And and it's interesting, like in my see with my own granddaughter, she needs a vernacular, but Hindi is not going to be it. So she's in a Spanish medium school. She's got a new vernacular. Nothing strange. All the Uzbeks who came into India dumped Uzbek and they picked up Dehlavi. It's now called Urdu. So it was already here when they came and they adopted it nicely because they needed something to do the work of uh, 
Uzbe what Uzbek was doing with them earlier. Uh, and I'm just astonished to see in my own family that they've moved on to a local vernacular because English is the high language of uh, tech. Tech is what it is now. And uh, Spanish is the local vernacular that's replaced Hindi. And, uh, but at the same time, having said that, this is not a sustainable situation because I know one generation down the line, Spanish will go. And we're already seeing Hindi, Marathi going with little kids right now. We are moving. How can we be different from a world where tech likes to work in one language, where banking works in one language? Where la language is not a thing. It is merely a mirror. And you see in the mirror what is there in the rest of the society. And we're moving into an increasingly global age. And uh, how can language preserve these lovely little gentle hiding places which no longer actually exist. So I have a lot of questions. There's only one way it can happen, and it's not a nice way. I'm from the Caribbean, where suddenly people who are Hindu Indians as opposed to Christian Indians and Muslim Indians are saying, we will preserve our language. What, is, what are they doing? They're setting up a political situation which is going to get them into immense trouble with Africans in the area who see it as setting up your own currency and seceding. You cannot go back to the past because the future is a different country. And uh, if we decide we are keeping a lot of very old languages and not for people like us who love to pore over old texts, um, it's going to have a political dimension to it and an economic dimension. Maybe only Indians know about some kind of tech. Huh? Or only Muslims know about something to do with electricals or something like that. And, but that's not what happens. You, you find the languages getting tied to a very communal kind of politics. And uh, if that's what is sustaining them, because what was sustaining them before that kind of atmosphere no longer exists. So I, my metaphor for that is like if you have a bike, a bicycle, it will stay upright as long as it's in motion. But as soon as you remove that motion, you have to prop it up with something or it will fall. And we are finding new things to prop up old languages with, and uh, which are in a way past their time because the world is no longer that world. So it's a scary thought because I've worked on language death and everybody thinks I want these languages to die when I'm the only one in the room who speaks them. But the fact is, it seems to be in the order of things. You can't have a world that is completely unified at the level of tech and um, other things that run the planet and have the kind of uh, gentle bucolic worlds that we once had. Something is happening. So I'm going to take us into the future. Where are we going? So we're actually going somewhere which we haven't yet reached. And we are enjoying, like last night, the last minutes of shadowless light after the sun has set. But after that comes something else, and we have to be aware. Wow, it's a, it's a very, very fascinating description, this uh, languages as mirrors. Uh, <laughs> I think this might be a good time for us to take questions from the audience, to open it up for everybody to participate in this conversation. Um, um, how do I go about this? Uh, anyway, yeah, please, please, um, please say your name and ask your question. And please be brief if I can request that. Yeah, thank you. Hello? Yeah, thank you for a fascinating session. And uh, simple question. Uh, at some point, image took over the script, or it is happening in, in front of us. How do you see it? And when do you think it started when image started competing with the written script? Um, would you like to take that? Yeah. So by, by image, I'm, I'm, 
I'm taking you to mean a kind of symbolic yeah, rather yeah. than a regular uh, yeah. use, right? Um, I think it has to do with the processes that, that uh, Peggy uh, described where something then has to be propped up for identity purposes rather than for legibility or for, for communication. What you're conveying is not the content of what the script represents, but um, something that it harks back to or something that you know it refers uh, a community or or an identity that it refers to rather than than its functional use so in in the case of modi script as well we see that it's not been taught regularly in schools since the 1950s um, and it's a specialist researcher's skill now but with the interest in Maratha history and, you know, with a lot more people now wanting to sort of look at original documents and, and think about, you know, the Maratha past, that has a political context too uh, in different ways. You see a lot of young people, for instance, coming to archives and so on saying, I want to learn the Modi script. You could go on YouTube and, and, and learn to, to read it. So there is a certain revival. but. On Marathi Raj Bhasha Din, you know, say 1st of May, or on Marathi Bhasha Gaurav Din, February 27th, you see a more calligraphic use of it, where people are not really sort of reading what's there. And in fact, you have literature, which was never in Modi, being put out there. Um, sort of, so it, it sort of, it's a handy visual reminder of Maratha glory, of the empire, uh, you know, of a thing, rather than the actual sort of, of function. You see this for many different uh, uh, scripts. So a certain ethnic thing is like, you know, the actual script is Roman, but there is a Velanti, there is a thing over here, you know, to, or there is that uh, Shiro, uh, that whatever. So, you know, you have all of those things that suggest other things rather than the uh, 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 actual functional use of the, of the script. Uh. Somebody here. Um, yes, hello, yeah. There. Thank you. Uh, I'm Giris and uh, I would like... You need not have to stand. Just... Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask uh, regarding to save any language. Like what should be done to save any language if we want? Asking Peggy, perhaps. What should be done to save languages? It might happen by itself if we have a real turn down in the economy. Collapse of the petrodollar would help tremendously. <laughs> use of fossil fuel to diminish, fall back on smaller communities. One of the things I used to talk about, a lot of things in my or common work with my husband who worked on transport, and that uh, it was a very similar situation that the better you set up the whole world, the more you have uh, people commuting longer distances in their daily lives. Distances are increasing, uh, energy use is increasing. You can't have languages uh, proliferating in that atmosphere. And as luck would have it, in some brutal form or the other, we are reaching limits. And at some point, we're going to have to start saying that uh, we will engage with people within our state, maybe make it that, and then have meeting people from other states a less common thing. But you can't have it both ways. You can't have this intense dialogue that you and I can have now uh, in English and have the other languages safe. So we have a, a very impossible choice. Unfortunately, we don't have to make the choice. The environment is going to inflict it on us when we are going to, and in many ways, even tech is not going to be hostile. When we had the lockdown and the pandemic, people were in a position to tune in to their Malayalam um, serials sitting in Delhi and be part virtually of a community that was smaller. And one could go back to that. Uh, but truly speaking, a language, you know, I have a lovely metaphor of Indian languages, and that's the Alfonso mango tree, and everybody thinks that that's a real tree. It's not. It's a grafted plant. You have this rootstock, 
which is there. And then you have um, this other thing that is grafted onto it, which is pretty, will give all the pretty flowers and pretty fruits that you want, but you want the strength of the roots. Until you actually stop the grafting and eat whatever quality of mangoes are coming from those roots, you are not going to have, um, have them survive well because languages need to be used in every possible domain. The day we can sit and talk in Hindi and Marathi about not only philosophical issues at a conference like this, but on technological issues, on things to do with the economy, physics. I mean, I was sitting having a conversation in a train with a physics professor from Uttarakhand. And my daughter, who had gone to a Hindi medium school as a junior school, she looked at me after and said, but Amma, you don't talk about that in Hindi. And I said, but we just did. We talked about thermodynamics in Hindi. And you could do it not very well. But supposing we did it often. Uh, which is what they do in China, though China is no shining example. They've killed off quite a lot of other v varieties of, of languages which are probably not even the same language. Um, and it has worked because once you have huge conglomerations of people, it's just inefficient to have many languages. You have to ask yourself first, why do you want them? If you know why you want them and it's not sentimentality, and that there's something about the language that really, really is going to help in your life, it will work. But the minute it is sentimentality, the metaphor I used in my book was, it's like a little child keeping a pet rat in a shoebox under his bed. He takes it out once a day, out of the dark, and pets it and gives it some food and puts it back in the box. That's what we're doing with our languages. They're not going to live very well like that. I mean... Fascinating, really. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Yes. Um, so I'm Kusum. I'm unable to identify who's asking this question. Ah, yes, please. I'm Kusum, and I wanted to ask Ms. Deshpande, okay, when we are talking of the Modi script, which started way, way back, and in which uh, the, the symbols are not very recognizable, Although we do have them on the, uh, we see some similarities with what is found on the, uh, what we have got from the Indus Valley. Is there a possibility that it might be somehow related to the ancient script of Sindh, which was known as Hatvanki? They all had these ancient scripts. Yeah. Uh, hello. Yeah. Um, you know, I think. If you peer hard enough at a symbol hmm. or at two symbols, I think we can come up with, with similarities, especially hmm. the longer back we, we, we go, uh, hmm. you know. So I think the, this question of, of origins and particularly hmm. some things like handwritten symbols hmm. um, or even those carved in, in, in stone and, and hmm. so on are uh, so subject to who actually carved them, uh, you know, what sort of, of hand was used and so on, that I particularly am, am very wary about making such, such sweeping connections between something that was so far back and something that's in, in Sindh and what we have attested evidence for from as late as the uh, uh, 15th and, and 16th centuries, you know. So people have said there have been many arguments. Uh, for instance, there's been a thing that Modi evolved independently from Maori um, and, you know, that it was, it was not really derived from, from Devanagari, um, you know, as sort of inscriptions moved to paper and there was the ability to join letters which was not really there in, in stone or in, in copper. So there's a material history to the way these symbols and things develop also over time and of course the functions that they're put to. But um, I find it a little bit difficult to make these, these connections. It's possible, but, um, but I couldn't say. Uh, uh. The reason why I asked was that we were talking of uh, Modi having a lot of symbols 
and we were wondering whether it has to do with trade or it has to do with some administrative matter, etc. Now, Hatwanki was created for that very purpose, basically trade. And Hatwanki survived into the modern era. I mean, my father used it for his business transactions. You know, when he was dealing with Sindhi traders, I'm a Sindhi, my father was a Sindhi. So, uh, Sindhi old time traders used to communicate with each other in Hatwanki, and the trade would go all the way to Russia across Central Asia. And because Hatwanki was a script which was closely held by the Sindhi community, nobody could read it. So their secrets were always safe. But from what I heard about the Modi script today, I was just wondering whether there might be some connection, because it's basically symbols. I mean, I've tried to learn it, but I'm not able to do so, because it's all symbols, and there's nobody to teach us now. Well, you know, I, I mean, I'll talk to you later and I'll, you I'll like give you a few the, YouTube yeah. links. You, like you know, there's, there's, a, there's material out there which will, which will help you. I mean, I, I learned it fairly recently for myself. Um, but, you know, I think that there may well be uh, conventions of writing that uh, developed among merchant communities and, and communities that needed documentation on a regular uh, basis. There are similarities between Mudia, uh, you know, used to write Rajasthani, uh, Mahajani, the Gujarati script. I mean, you know, there are, if, you, if you look at Modi and you look at the Gujarati script, you can immediately see there are so many letters that are, are, are similar. So cursive scripts, I think, that were used particularly by merchant communities in different parts of the subcontinent, especially those that came in contact. I think, yes, there is the possibility of gov given and take, and you will find, find similarities, uh, you know. So, um, so it is worth exploring, but, and, you know, Modi is not that difficult. Uh, that aura of, of secrecy is partly, or difficulty or illegibility is partly something that, came out of, you know, the fact that these were specialized skills helped by particular groups, and those skills were jealously guarded as well, uh, you know, they were within families and they didn't really kind of go uh, out, and they were taught to s in schools for a long time and, and, and so on, and now because they're not there, they seem somehow more difficult than, than they are, you know. Uh, so, and like I said, a lot of younger people have now taken to, to, to learning it, so, so uh, it should be, it should be possible. Thank you. I have a little tiny comment I wanted to make. Since I suddenly realized I saw a book of mine up there, which I wasn't going to bring into the discussion here, there is a courtroom scene in, the, in that, the youngest suspect, where I mention Mori because it's taking place in Ahmedabad. And I, I'm trying to explain to the judge why one would use not modern Gujarati, but in fact uh, Mori. And I told her that this, a very important issue in a courtroom is speed. Because the speed at which you can take dictation, be, and the whole case actually hinged on how fast could a scribe actually write. And how fast would he write in Gujarati? How fast would he write in Mori? How fast could he type? He could type at 60 words per minute, but he could not write, even in Mori, at that speed. And that's, we won the case on that. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can take about uh, one or two more questions. Uh, yes, Maya? Thank you. That was such a great session. Um, you know, I was thinking about this recent uh, drive to uh, 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 start medical education in uh, regional languages and, you know, local languages. And uh, I think they've started with even printing some textbooks in Hindi. So I was, a, I was just wondering, like, on the one hand, it might seem uh, sort of, um, you know, tied to some kind of restrictive political agenda. It may seem 
wildly uh, impractical and also ahistorical, given how technical education has shaped up in you know, colonial, post-colonial India. Uh, and on the other hand, it might be that it's actually worthwhile these professions of power, like Peggy was saying, that run the world, etc. Uh, what would it look like to actually rearticulate these in the language of uh, in the language of people? Uh, so, rather than you know, these things get so polarized yeah. today in their conversations. But rather than that kind of response, how could we think about? How could we use this kind of event to think about some of the things that, you know, Prachi was saying yesterday also and today in uh, this conversation here? So, Okay, since you're mentioning uh, about uh, technical things, medical education being in local languages, I mean, a large number of countries simply do it. I mean, Iceland can do it with three lakh people and wonderful uh, fonts for everything so that it has a very finished look. It is a political decision. And unfortunately in India, we may not like the politics behind the decision, but it can only be a political decision. My wonderful example is uh, in India, people who are not English speaking, which is to say the very Savarna Brahminical background are completely cut out from tech and from science and various things. All our craftspeople who would have been innovative and who would have uh, had ideas and be bold and make new things which don't exist anywhere for our environment, they have been pushed back into being daily wage laborers simply because they don't know English. And the people who, are, who do know English, well, lucky for us that some of them are good but not all are suited to the work that they monopolize. So I look at my own family, since I mentioned to you that we're from a goldsmith background. In India, I would never be sitting on this. I would be sitting polishing your jewelry for you quietly in the corner. I would be from a daily wage labor group. But in, my, in the Caribbean, my great, -grand, my great grandfather, who was born there, his father came from India, he decided that we're going to do it in a phased manner. He and his brothers set up as goldsmiths in different parts of the country. Then the next generation was educated. And then the, after that came my father's generation. He was sent to study metallurgy. His brother was sent to do chemistry. Another one was sent to do dentistry. And my boa, my aunt, was sent to do optics. There was that. All of these were regarded as allied professions to being a goldsmith. And then, now, my generation, I can be a linguist because we, it's considered that now we are secure. We have taken our craft trade, our, our caste background to where it likely could have gone, but was not allowed to in India. Now, to what extent has English been a factor in India in keeping out the kind of people whose children should be doing dentistry, optics, uh, metallurgy, and uh, what else, chemistry, electricals. We, we did electroplating at home in our, back, in our workshop. Every boy, my brother went to medical school. Before he went, it was his job to make one line of tavis because we sold Tavises, and it was the first thing a boy had to learn to make. So we were blending what we were with what we were going to be, and that was, well, we had English, but, we, but here it has become a gatekeeper. So in that context, the question you ask, what would happen if we had medical education in English? I think nothing would go wrong. I can't imagine what could go wrong, because if you have to talk about something that was not made in India or process that was not made in India, we would do what we already do anyway. We use the word from somewhere else. But put it into a matrix, a concrete, that the children studying actually understand better. How many of us who have taught in English medium schools don't always teach in English anyway? 
It's very important. Like, I look at little children and I try to tell them about a bat. It's a chimgadar. They've not heard of a chimgadar. Pull out your cell phone, get an image, show it to them. Yay, chimgadar, and look at the wings and so. The point is we, we already do it, but we say we don't. And we could make it more formal and allow a blending of the two. It would, I think what's wonderful is that it would bring in the kind of people look, who really genuinely care to be doctors. Do you think that most of the people who, because they have the highest numbers in maths and physics, and they've gotten into med school, are necessarily the most compassionate doctors? So I would be a devil's ab advocate and say that while I don't like the politics behind it, only politics could have made it an issue. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you're right that there's a lot of polarization uh, around these, these uh, issues. But what Peggy said towards the end, you know, that ultimately, if we return it to a more functional space rather than one that becomes one of very narrow identity and representation and pitting one language against the other, right? So then we might actually get somewhere. But then we have to ask the question that when we say, okay, the language of the people, we have to define the people. Right? And there is no agreement then on who those people are. Um, and, you know, that has a long history to it. How do you actually define who the, the speakers of that language are? People, you want, to, want it in Hindi? Hindi is, is, you know, sort of now being touted also as the national language, not just the official language. But you know the backlash against, against that as well. So again, then we start coming to these kind of like onion-like, you know, frameworks of, okay, let's peel this layer away, let's peel this layer, and come to some authentic core of, of, of language, and then we will have our textbooks in, in that. We are still stuck in peeling those layers away, you know. But I think... Um, to go back to the earlier question also, like how can a language be saved, you know? Yes, of course, I agree with the, the larger kind of grim picture that is there. But if you again go into history not very long ago, you know, 100 and 150 years ago, it did seem then that, you know, there were moves to turn all of India's languages into the Roman script in the name of uniformity and efficiency and so on. And there are certain technological reasons, but also other reasons why this didn't happen. And then there were some very passionate people or in every language that said, let's try to do this, you know. Let's try and write a, a let's try and improve the script. Let's try and do this. Sometimes all it takes also is a few committed people to start a project uh, you know, and um, historians then find that, oh, I never knew that this happened. Perhaps it didn't go very far, uh, but uh, that's a kind of trigger that's often needed to, to, to do this. Now, we think really that nothing much is happening in technical education or so on in the regional languages. But the Maharashtra state, when it was uh, set up in 1960, you know, there was this huge project to develop technical vocabulary in, in a range of, of uh, uh, topics. Almost, I think, something like 84 uh, lexicons were created for everything from banking to administration to literary criticism to agriculture and so on. Those are all available online. You know, they've been scanned and they're, they're searchable. I've used them for my writing in, in Marathi as well. Um, for this, uh, last week, uh, somebody decided to hold a workshop for writing Marathi in LaTeX, uh, you know, how to actually do it. Often, it, it really takes the people, ultimately, also to, to, to engage with these, these issues. We often expect the government to do it. When it's top-down, it can always only be a centralizing process that will leave out a lot of smaller people and disadvantaged people out. If it can be ground up, and I know I'm sounding utopian over here, but if it can be somehow ground up in small spaces, you know, working with what are often designated dialects and therefore not proper language and so on, and if we work with multilinguality as a fact rather than as a problem, you know, pehle inko nikalo, fir 
you know, pure language dialogue. I mean, that is never going to. Then, of course, the road is only towards monolinguality at a larger, larger, larger uh, level. Uh, you know, so so yeah, it's it's grim and it's complicated. But I also kind of uh, you know want to to hang on to that that possibility that ultimately, yes, you know, uh, people can and and should make the efforts that they can in their in their uh, languages. Uh, just to add, because being a historian, I can't help it. Uh, <laughs> there was an attempt to start medical education in, in Bangla medium in the late, in the 18th century, uh, during the colonial period, of course. And see, uh, you know, it uh, somehow happened that the students enrolling in the Bangla medium education in medicine, uh, you know, uh, the number exceeded those who were studying in English medium. So the British government decided to <laughs> stop this and go back to English. Now that you can only become a doctor if you know English. So this is the basic qualificatory, yeah. Yes. Um, right, 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 right. And in Marathi as well. Ah, in Grand Marathi Medical as well. Uh, but that is, which the, of course, Bangla should be the first to start anything in this <laughs> country. Uh, well, maybe, maybe you just don't, you just do it and don't have any label attached to it. It's happening anyway. Wonderful, yeah. All right, now I think uh, it's time for us to stop, take a break. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I thank the uh, speakers. Um, thank, thank you, you, thank you. It's, it's been a great thank honor you. and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would request Amit to give mementos to the speakers. Let me correct one more uh, mistake. It was there in my notes. I made a mistake. I should, I invite Dinesh to come on stage. Uh, I forgot to mention that we would not have been able to receive any money for this event if CFDA, the Center for Development Alternatives, was not there. So I would request Dinesh to come on stage and receive a memento. And also I forgot to mention that the mementos are given to us by Prosperity Mitra. So thank you for them to them for giving us <clears throat> In Hindi, since we are talking about languages, we say ghar ke murgi dar barabar. Uh, Dinesh is a very old friend, so I can take liberties with him. <clears throat> Thank you once again. Uh, we will have lunch now and come back at 2. Uh, please come back on time and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy the next session as well. Hello. Uh, so lunch is available uh, for people on in the cafe on the first floor, at the ground floor of the university center. You can go in there, see you. Uh, speakers will be escorted uh, to the destination for lunch. Thank you.